Audio Frog, and uh, I'm here today to talk about a little thing that we may call the UMI-1. Um, it is a measurement kit um, designed for, I think designed for, for professional installers, especially guys who are, who are getting started and learning how to tune cars. And um, we sell a fair number of these things to, to enthusiasts as well, who, uh, um, you know, for whom car audio is their hobby and, and uh, they spend um, all weekend in the garage working on their cars and, and tuning cars and, uh, and whatnot. Um, so years ago, when I started at my last job, I was hired as a product manager and I was basically a trainer. Um, and when I showed up on the job, they gave me a computer that had inside of it was a Melissa card. And only engineers know what a Melissa card is, but this was a big card that required, um, re it was a full size, a full size card that would go into a, into a computer. This was before there was such a thing as a laptop. So the computer they handed me was a lunchbox. It was a big plastic thing about the size of maybe a Dell mid-sized desktop, but it had a handle on it, and the and it had a cover with a latch. And when you when you unlatch the cover, you'd fold it up, and and it uh, it had a little LCD screen about this big in the middle of this uh, in the middle of this cover, and it was a DOS machine. Um, so I traveled around the country uh, with this thing um, and did. Did, uh, did trainings for a line of products, um, but this was the beginning of uh, me learning how to use audio test gear um, after I left retail, because at retail we had an audio control RTA, and we had another crown RTA, which I kind of liked because it was big and cool and had a color display. So, so after I became pretty proficient at using a PC in the form in which PCs existed at the time, um, I thought, wow, this would be really cool because Prior to PCs, the only way to make a high quality measurement was to have really high quality hardware. And that meant having, uh, so the, the high quality mic at the time, um, and, and we had some of these um, in the lab, was made by B&K, and B&K still makes microphones, but it was a, it was a finely crafted, um, uh, precision tuned and calibrated microphone that came along with not only a microphone preamp, but also an analyzer. Um, this was thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. That that Melissa card that was in my computer was about a $6,000 piece of hardware. Um, uh, and it was just designed to crunch numbers. And and it did, um, for $6,000, what Rumi Q Wizard, uh, part of what Rumi Q Wizard can do now. Um, so I got kind of proficient at using, the, uh, using this thing. And then along came laptops, and, and as a business traveler, they handed me a laptop with, with Outlook so that they could email me at any time, day or night. And, and uh, onto this laptop, I installed a bunch of, you know, a bunch of programs, and, and uh, <clears throat> there were some early sort of beginner um, audio analysis programs. So, so I put together a kit of a sound card and a microphone and some other stuff that I could carry around so that when I went to do dealer trainings and somebody asked me for help tuning their car, I could break out this stuff. And, and um, over the course of five or 10 years, I suppose, I, I convinced a few people to consider using a, PS, a, a PC as test gear for car audio. But it was a big hassle because in order to do this, you had to A, be kind of a PC nerd because audio inside the PC is not straightforward. Um, and then you had to buy a sound card, you had to buy a mic, and you had to, you know, it had to, there were some good ones and there were some bad ones, and there were combinations that worked. And so I had a list of things that I would suggest to people that they buy in order to do this. And this has continued um, up until three or four years ago. So I would, so I would tell them, hey, here's this list of stuff, go buy this stuff, literally 150 bucks worth of stuff. Um, and then call me and I'll help you learn to use it. So five days later, I would get an email or a call from people that say, well, I didn't buy this sound card because this other one was $8 cheaper. And I didn't buy that microphone because this other one seemed like a better deal and I liked the color better and blah, 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 blah. So I was tech supporting an infinite number of iterations of this kit. Um, and in addition to, to the fact that these kits were ever changing, 
there didn't exist anywhere any kind of an instruction manual or, or anything outside of the help files for some of these programs about what kind of gear you would need and how to get this stuff set up. And then there were also no instructions for, for, for using it to make a car sound better. And this is kind of what I do. So, so, so we decided one day, um, maybe five or six years ago, that instead of tech supporting this infinite uh, number of iterations of, of uh, stuff that you could buy to tune your car with a PC, we would just make a kit. And, and so the kit is this UMI-1, but along with this kit, and you can, prior to purchase or for free, you can go to audiofrog.com and then click on test gear at the top, scroll all the way down, and not only are there step-by-step -step instructions for hooking this thing up, and, and configuring it um, in the PC, there's also a big document um, that, that, uh, that I put together, which is kind of an instruction manual for using, um, uh, using this or, or frankly any mic um, to make a car sound good. It's an instruction manual for tuning a car and, and it's long, it's about 65 pages long. The, the process is probably the last 20 pages. Um, and the first 40 pages are an explanation of what a stereo system is designed to do and how it does it. So my suggestion here is that, especially if you're a professional, if you're an installer working in the bay, that so everybody says time is money, um, and time is money, of course. Um, but but what's really important if you do this work professionally is that you can tell someone who's paying you to do it how long it's going to take. And so that you can tell them what the outcome is going to be because you're going to do it for a fee, right? Um, so you need to be able to say, hey man, for a couple hundred bucks or 400 bucks or $12,000 or whatever it is that you're going to charge, you need to be able to set expectations. And the expectations from a customer are, what's it going to sound like and how long is it going to take for you to do it, right? So in, as a former installer, I know that we're notoriously bad at telling somebody how long something is going to take. Um, so, so what's really helpful in trying to establish value for a consumer is to be able to deliver on what you predict, right? Which is, if it's going to take me four hours, then I need to be able to deliver it in four hours or less. Um, and I also need to be able to either demo or explain to a customer in a way that makes sense to him what he can expect for what we're going to charge him for those four hours. For, for enthusiasts, um, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation about what it takes to about what it takes to tune a car. So the whole objective here of the UMI one um, is to make it easier, um, make it easier, make it more predictable, um, uh, to make better sounding cars um, in a way that that can be taught. Because if tuning cars has to be, or if if, if we say that tuning cars is is, a, is part of a gift, you know, one of the one of the gifts that we're given when when we get our DNA, um, then that severely limits the number of people that we can count on to deliver great sounding cars. And it also makes it really easy for somebody who could in fact learn how to do this pretty easily to say, oh man, I don't have the right genes. But everybody's got the right genes and this is really not all that difficult. So that's what UMI1 is for. So a minute ago I mentioned that years ago in order to make high quality measurements, we had to have a, a, a finely crafted and and precision tuned um, kind of a thing because what a microphone should really do is tell us without any, w without providing any any coloration of its own what it is in fact that we're listening to. So, so a high quality mic should be one that 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 measures flat response. Um, so that if we measure something that that we see exactly the frequency response of that thing without any with without any like roll off at high frequency or a big peak in the mid range or something like that that would be imposed by the microphone. So PCs give us an opportunity to dramatically reduce the cost of making a high quality measurement. And that is because a PC is basically a data cruncher. So if we can have a calibration file for a mic, which is a, which is a frequency response for the mic, we can invert that frequency response in the computer so that the measurement that we see in the computer is corrected um, so, so one of these, uh, one of these super high end, perfectly flat mics, um, can be thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, um, which would make it virtually impossible for somebody, or maybe not impossible because somebody could do it, but, but it makes it a super expensive tool. 
um, and we need something that's more accessible. So fortunately, the fact that we're using PC allows us to make a really, really high quality measurement from a microphone so long as we know the frequency response of that microphone. Calibrating microphones, however, is not straightforward. Um, <clears throat> it requires, there are many different ways to do it, um, many different ways to do it, but what we, what we need to make sure of is that we account for the frequency response of the microphone. So each of these, each of these microphones, um, and you and my one, and you and my ones are are individually calibrated. And I have a jig um, that makes it possible uh, to to calibrate these things. So a minute ago, I mentioned that that making a high quality measurement used to require the use of a really expensive microphone, which had to be precision, you know, precision crafted and and calibrated along with a piece of hardware. But, but PCs make it possible for us to make an equally high quality measurement with, um, with a less expensive mic. Um, and what makes that possible is that if we know what the frequency response of the microphone is, the computer can correct for that frequency response by inverting it and adding that to the measurement. And this is what the calibration of the microphone is designed to do. So each of these UMI1s is, uh, is individually calibrated. And after you get your UMI1 um, uh, via UPS or DHL or the US mail or, or however it arrives, um, each of the microphones has a serial number and it comes on a little card and I'll show, that, show you that later. But if you send an email um, to testgear at audiofrogusa.com, um, then I look up the, the, the calibration file for your specific microphone um, and send it to you. And then you can make high quality measurements with this thing um, at a much more reasonable, uh, much more reasonable cost. Now we have our microphone placed in the car uh, on the, uh, the headrest with the Velcro strap. And in the pocket of this uh, kit, you'll find a microphone extension cable. Um, so you can plug the extension cable into the cable from the car, and this gives you some room to work outside the car. Um, so sometimes people say that, that uh, if you're going to listen while sitting in the car, that you have to make the measurements while sitting in the car, and this is absolutely not the case. Um, and the target curve that we'll talk about later is designed for you to be outside of the car. So if you do this work, um, you'll discover that, that being outside the car is much nicer than being inside the car um, uh, because you don't have to listen to the pink noise for 20 or 30 or 45 minutes or an hour, however long this, uh, however long this takes. But sitting in the car with the computer often puts the screen in between you and the speaker and that creates an additional obstruction. And none of that would matter if we had a target curve that took all of that into account. So the target curve that we're gonna use is designed for measuring the car without someone being in the car. Um, and it's no less an accurate measurement because this target curve has been designed so that when you get in the car, tuning it to that target curve sounds good. So this notion that, that, uh, that we have to measure under exactly the same circumstances as we listen doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all, because if, if that were required, then for people who make chairs, wouldn't you need to be sitting in the chair while they made it? Or if you were gonna have a house built, wouldn't, shouldn't it be necessary for you to be in the house while the construction crew is there building the house? No, of course not. The same thing holds, right? So we have a target curve that's designed to make cars sound good when we measure without somebody being in the car. And that's convenient for us because it's easier to use the PC um, um, and it works great. So the next thing we need to do is to set up Room EQ Wizard, which is the program that I suggest using. Um, uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve, um, but it's A, it's free, B, it's really powerful, more powerful than that thing that, that I used to carry around in that lunchbox computer that was $6,000. And it gives you a lot of room to grow as you, as you grow in your understanding of how to do this, uh, how to do this work. Sometimes we want to make other measurements, um, and REW makes that really easy. So we have the sound card here, and we want to plug our microphone into the mic input. And on the sound card, there's a little, uh, there's a little icon here for a microphone right there. So we want to plug this in here. And then we want to plug the sound card into any USB port, any USB port in this computer. Okay, so now that's set up. So the next thing to do is to open REW, open Room EQ Wizard, and go to Preferences. And in Preferences, we want to load our. So we have a, we have several tabs here. We have sound card. We have mic meter and all kinds of stuff. So the second thing to do is to load our microphone calibration file. So we go here 
to Mike Meter, we click on Browse, and then we go to the, the place where we've saved our microphone calibration file, and that's the one that, that you would get in an email from us after sending us the sound, uh, after sending us the serial number. So the microphone here is number 1034, 1034, see 1034. Um, so we're going to find 1034, which is here somewhere. 1034, we're going to click on that and click open. And that loads our microphone calibration file so that the measurement that we make is the measurement of the sound in the car without any contribution from uh, the frequency response of the microphone. So now we've put the CD in the CD player um, and select track one, which is mono pink noise. Um, and I'd encourage you to read the process. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So we want to start with either the left channel or the right channel. So we're going to start with the left channel here. So the pink noise is playing. The microphone is in position. And now we're going to close the door so we don't have to listen to all of that. Um, and we're going to go back to REW. So in REW, we can close preferences. We can close preferences and we can select RTA. So I like to maximize this here and then click this button here to turn on the RTA. And there is, there is the sound of the left channel. Um, so up here, we can select any, just about any resolution. We're going to start with third octave. So there's third octave. And then over here on this vertical scale, we want to set this up so that we have 5 dB per division because it makes it easier for us to see our, makes it easier for us to see our graph. And we want this to be from 20 to 20K. So we can use these little buttons here to to increase the vertical scale or decrease the vertical scale. So now we have 75, 70, 65, 60, 55, whatever. Okay, so, so we don't care for this exercise about the absolute level. It doesn't matter whether this is 70 or 80. This is not the, this is not the actual volume of the level in the car. That requires another process and a calibrated sound level meter. But when we're tuning cars, what we're really interested in is the relative level of one frequency to another. We're just concerned about the shape. So one of the great things about PCs as test gear is that many of these programs will allow us to display our target curve on the RTA while we're tuning. This is kind of like a router template for audio. It makes it much easier, um, uh, makes it much easier for us to do the work of equalizing the car um, because we have a because we have a target. Here, I'll show you. So loading the target, loading the target curve, <clears throat> and this is explained on page 37 or 38 of that big document that you can download called a straightforward, uh, a straightforward 1C tuning process and some notes about how it works. You can find that on the audio frog, the test gear section of the audio frog site. Um, so loading, loading this target curve is pretty simple. What we want to do is go to file, import, import frequency response, and then we want to look for where we've saved the target curve, which you can download from, uh, from the AudioFrog website. So in my computer, this is, we're going to have to go find this, this is in documents, wait, not OneDrive, here we go, okay, documents, Audio test rig, instructions, final docs, and we want to load this audio frog target curve for REW. Okay. So now in the measurement window, which is not our RTA, we have this curve loaded. You'll notice that this curve is centered on zero on zero on zero dB. So when we go back to the RTA, when we go back to the RTA, we don't see it. Where is it? It's way down here. There it is, right? But we, but it would be really helpful if we position this over our measurement so that we have, um, so that so that we have a target, so we know where to bring things up and bring things down. So ideally, what we want to do is position the target where there's a dip. We want to cut when we EQ rather than boosting. So instead of placing the target curve so that it corresponds to the peaks, we want to make it so that it corresponds to the dip. So we know that the target curve is centered at zero dB. So we have a dip here at about 400 hertz, and that dip is at 57.5 dB. 
So now what we want to do is minimize the RTA, go to this curve right here, go to controls, add to data. So we want to move this target curve up by 57.5 dB. Add to data. Now it's moved up. Right? Now it's way up over here. So when we go back to RTA, there it is. Right? So now we have our target curve. We have a little bit of work to do on this car. Um, now we have our target curve. And this makes it really easy because now when we EQ, we can look for a peak here. We can click on it. We can see that it's at 1.5K and at 64 dB. So we can, we can easily see that this is about 7 dB. So in our EQ, we would select 1.5K and then we would reduce this by, by, uh, <clears throat> uh, by 7 dB. And we would just continue doing that along this curve until we get to something that, uh, something that hits our target. So we just we just scaled our target curve, and we we got our we got our graph on the we got our graph on the screen so that we can begin EQing it. So one of the things that I really suggest doing before you do this so so great tools don't make us great carpenters or great mechanics or or great engineers or whatever they they help us, um, but but doing the work requires practice. Nobody ever learned anything by simply reading a document the first time. Uh, it, it requires practice, and sometimes we we try uh, we we try something new, and we fail, um, and we say, "Oh, well, that thing doesn't work." Well, that's usually not the case. In 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 learning how to do something, we need we need to practice, um, and we get better as we practice. And the idea behind having a process is to give us something to practice, so that we're not every time we try this willy nilly starting from scratch. Um, so the first time that you do this work, you'll make a significant improvement in the way that your car sounds, but it's not going to be perfect, right? You can go on the SQ forums and, and, and talk endlessly about all kinds of stuff and read all kinds of tips and tricks and, and other stuff to do. But my suggestion is before you go sticking other stuff in a process or before you go designing a process of your own, um, learn one. There are a hundred processes and everybody talks about a different process for, for doing this. But if you've never done this before, it's really important to pick one and stick with it until you understand how that process works and why it works. Um, I'm kind of a foodie, and sometimes I like to read blogs um, uh, written by written by chefs and whatever, and, and they go through this exact same thing, where they'll post a recipe that they've made a thousand times, and they know that it works, and they've sold it to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who've all said, man, this is... This is, the, this is the best taco van I've ever eaten. So they publish the recipe online, and, and three days later, there are a bunch of people suggesting that it didn't work. And it didn't work because they substituted vermouth for wine, or they used a pig instead of a chicken, or all kinds of other stuff. Um, so this process works, but you'll need to learn it. So what I suggest doing before you start is to print this document. Yes, it's long. Um, uh, it's not so hard to read. The first half of this is explaining why this process works, and it talks about how recordings are made, and it talks about how we should choose crossovers, and, and uh, all of it is designed. This whole thing, EUMI1, this process, all the stuff that you can download on our website is really, is, are really small parts of a bigger whole. This is how to do this work. Um, so print this, read through this the first time. Um, it may take you a couple of sittings, depending on how much you read. You may want to put this in the bathroom so that you can read it when, when you're in there. But, but print this so that you can have it while you're learning how to do this work, while you're learning which crossover points you should use or how to EQ, because it's, because it's all in here. This is an instruction manual. Um, so read it once the first time, and then keep it with you while you, while you, learn, how to, while you learn how to do this. Um, <clears throat> so this goes with that. This is free. Um, you can download this and read it before you decide you want to buy a UMI1. If you already have some other kit that you know how to use, um, but you're struggling with the process, then, then download this, um, because this will help you out. Since we don't have time to make this an entire instructional video about how to tune a car, um, um, we've left that part out, because it takes a little while. Um, so we're, we're finished tuning. We're finished with the objective part of the process. The objective part is using the microphone to hit the target curve. 
um, with the left channel and then matching that to the right channel in, in whatever order. So sometimes people think that, that what I suggest is that, that that objective process is the end and that once we've finished the objective process that we're done, we can put away all of our stuff. This is not entirely true. Um, so, so, so I really do advocate for an objective process because for professionals, for people who are trying to do this, for customers who are paying them uh, when they need to tell them it's going to be done on Friday afternoon, um, having an objective process really contributes to predictability. So the, the, the reason for an objective process is to get us as close to the end of the process as we can get without having to, to do a bunch of subjective analysis. What I don't suggest is setting the delays and then listening to the car or setting the delays and then setting the crossovers and then listening to the car. This doesn't need to be an iterative process of small improvements to get to the end um, where each time we make a small improvement, we have to subjectively analyze that improvement because, because the chicken's not finished, right? We don't taste the chicken after we salt it, right? We don't take a big bite out of a raw chicken breast and go, hmm, maybe it needs more salt. We get to the end of the recipe and then we, uh, and, and, and then we taste it and then we make some adjustments. We add salt, we add pepper, we put a bunch of hot sauce on it, we dip it in honey or whatever else. So at the end of the objective process, we need to verify with our ears that we've done things correctly. So, so sometimes we could put in our Nora Jones track and listen to make sure that Nora Jones is in the center, but maybe you hate Nora Jones and maybe the music that you really love is not um, uh, the kind of music that you could use uh, to verify that all of the EQ is right and whatever else. I mean, I'm certainly not going to put in a Rolling Stones, um, a Rolling Stones track in, uh, recorded in 1962, to to determine whether this whether this stuff is right. So that's where this CD comes in. So the CD includes a bunch of technical tracks at the beginning to help us determine that we've tuned adequately for the image of the bass to sound like it comes from the front, um, for things, events, vocals, instruments that are mixed in the center to appear in the, in the center of the dashboard. So we need technical tracks that are specifically designed to help us do that and to help us do that quickly. So track one on the disc is mono pink noise and that's what you would use when you're setting the, uh, when you're, when you're setting the EQ. Um, the next set of tracks are band limited pink noise. They're mono pink noise in various frequency bands. Um, track two is mono pink noise from 20 hertz to 160 hertz. So we can play that while we, while we sit and listen and all of that sound from 20 hertz to 160 hertz, if we've done this correctly, should appear in the center of the dash. It's mono and it's mostly bass. So this is designed to help us get the sound of the bass that's in the front. And some tips for doing that are part of the process and they're in that document, but we can listen to pink noise from 20 hertz to 160 hertz, which is kind of annoying, but we're done tuning this car and all of that bass appears in the center of the dash and in front of the car. So we know that we've done that correctly. So then we can move to the next track, which is mono pink noise from 80 to 400. And this will help us determine this will help us determine that our mid bass is correctly placed, right? So yes, in here, the mid bass sounds like it comes from the center of the dash, so that's correct. We can move on to the next one, which includes a little more high frequency, 400 to 1K. So this is really our mid range. And that also appears to come from the center of the dash. And then from 400 to 20K, same thing. Sounds like it comes from the center of the dash. Okay, so now that we've done that, there are a couple of musical tracks. Um, um, on one of the competition discs, there used to be a track where there were seven drum beats that would move across the dash, and that was really helpful, except for one thing. They were snare drums, and they didn't. This, this, the sound of the snare drum didn't really include any mid bass. So using that track, we can make it so that the mid range and the high frequencies sound like they sound like they move across the dash correctly. But there's no mid bass in the track, so we can't really check the mid bass. So on this disc, there's a bass guitar that moves across, and there's a piano that moves across. So this is an opportunity to check to make sure that our mid bass is correct, um, uh, which will help us check for for setting de delays correctly. Um, and, uh, and also levels, and then the same thing at higher frequencies for the, for the piano. So we'll start with those. So here's the bass guitar on the left. So that's 
sounds like it comes from the left door. Move to the next track. This is left of center. It sounds like it comes from right here. Center comes from the center of the dash. Right of center. And right. Then we have the same thing, um, the same thing with the piano. So we'll do that real quick. So here's the piano on the left, right here, left of center, right here, center, right there, right of center, and right. So with music, this sounds, with music, this sounds correct. So also on this disc, after the bandwidth, after the band limited pink noise, there's also pink noise that moves across the dash in the same way. So we can do that with pink noise. Same thing. Pink noise sounds like it's coming from here. Left of center, pink noise sounds like it's coming from here. Center, from the center. Right of center. And right. So those tracks those tracks are specifically designed so that the so that we don't have to guess about where the signals are. If we're using a if, if we're using a, a a disc with music that we like, but we don't know specifically how it's recorded, then we may tune for a center vocal to appear in the center when the vocal wasn't really recorded to be in the center. Um, but those tracks are designed specifically um, so that left is left and right of right is right, center is center, and left of center should be exactly in between our center image and 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 far left, and right of center should be exactly in between our center image and 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 far right. So this kind of takes the guesswork out of this. So there's some other music uh, that's also on the that's also on the CD. Um, and if you read the CD liner notes, you'll you'll see why some of that's been chosen. Um, uh, one of the tracks uh, includes the sound of someone talking and then singing, and you'll see you'll hear two completely different rooms. Um, uh, there's another track that follows that immediately, where there's where there's a lot of room in the recording. You'll hear a sense of space, and the stage will move back. Um, all of those kinds of cues are in the music. There's no trick to making a stage deeper or wider then um, is included in the recording. And then there are a couple of other um, EDM tracks uh, that will help you uh, with getting the impact um, of the bass and the mid-bass um, in the front of the car. So the CD is a really, really, really important part of the process. Um, so, so the UMI One kit, along with the instructions for setting it up uh, with the computer, and the process document that explains how to make a car sound good using this and the CD are really designed to go together um, to give you a whole suite of tools and a process um, for doing this work. So I really encourage you to, to give this one a shot before adding other tips and tricks or whatever else. And of course, um, you can find um, a bunch of uh, additional uh, tech and additional writings about how to do this uh, in the Audio Frog Tech Blog, which you can also find on the Audio Frog website at www.audiofrog.com. Thank you.